how to increase your credit score. Now I know you may be asking yourself, my credit score is a 500, it's a 410. Well guess what? I'm gonna give you all the information you need to know to increase your credit score today. Because it's all based on information. What if I told you, if you follow this information to a T, you'll be able to increase your credit score as much as 150 points. What if I told you, based off of the strategy that I'm gonna give you, you'll always be able to maintain your credit. And based off of the information that I'm going to share with you, people have even been able to go out there and start their own credit repair companies. Now, I actually had a video back in 2018 on how to get the perfect credit score. So what I want to do is come back and actually reshoot because there's some new information that you may need to get those additional 50 points to get the 150 points. And so sit back, take some notes. Remember, a short pencil is better than a long memory, in this case a marker and I'm gonna give you the information you are going to need that you're not gonna to wanna to miss on how to increase your credit score. So now let's start with the basics because that's what it's all about. First of all, what is a credit score? A credit score is a three digit number that is used pretty much as your digital fingerprint. Think about it. Everything that you do is based upon your credit score, literally. Have you tried to go and apply for employment? They're running your credit. Insurance, they run your credit. For auto insurance, health and life insurance, bank accounts. Banks are now running your credit to open a bank account. You know, I had a, a client who couldn't rent an instrument for their daughter because their credit was bad. And then of course, tr Lord forbid you, try to, you need to get an apartment. You're trying to purchase a vehicle. Yeah, you may get approved with a bad credit score, but now you're paying as much as 29% interest rate on a depreciating asset. Let's say you want to start a business. Your credit score can dictate whether you get approved for the building you're trying to apply for. Trying to get a business credit card, they're still going to look at your personal credit. So all of these things and pretty much in everything that we do in our lives is dictated by our credit score. I like to call it your, it's like your second fingerprint. See, everything that you do is tied to your credit score. You know, I've actually talked to people who their dating life was impacted <laughs> because they had bad credit. So understand our credit score dictates everything that we do in our life. You know, sometimes I've talked to people who have bad credit, who've had bad attitudes. See, cause one of the things I've learned when you have good credit, you walk differently. You walk into the dealership differently. You walk into the bank differently. You walk into a date differently when you have good credit. And so what I want to do is give you the information to help you become more confident, be able to go to the negotiating table with the bank, be able to walk into that dealership and be able to sit down with confidence and fill out that credit application by being able to increase your credit score. Now, some of you may or may not know, and I never assume that, we, that everybody knows this information. Now there's three major credit bureaus, and I'm gonna tell you those three, because here's the thing, they don't talk to each other. They don't communicate with each other. They don't even share the exact same information. So literally you can have a 500 credit score on one, a 600 credit score on another one, and a 700 credit score on the third. Now those three major credit bureaus are Experian, Equifax and TransUnion. And that's right. These companies are in three different parts of the country. Now these are private entities and all they do is sit around and collect data and sell our information. That's how they make billions of dollars. Matter of fact, they're backed by banks, which is how they make so much money. And again, as I mentioned, you literally could have a 500 on Experian a 600 on Equifax and a 700 on TransUnion, which is why you actually want to be able to pull all three of your credit reports, what I like to call a three in one credit report. Now there's a ton of different places where you can go and pull your credit report. Now, some people like to say, you know what? You don't have to pay for your credit report. You get a free one every single year. And that is true. You can actually go to annualcreditreport.com and get a free credit report once a year. Now, that's the upside. Let me tell you the downside to that. Now, let's say you pull, go to annualcreditreport.com, you pull your three-in-one, well, you have to pull them separately in January. 
Okay. Now they've, there've been a ton of data breaches, you know, over the past four years, they actually still happen every single day. And let's say there was a data breach where someone compromised your information and they assumed your identity. They used your identity, they applied for some credit cards, never made the payment, eventually it went to collections. Now because you don't monitor your credit, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what credit monitoring it is, what credit monitoring is, because you don't monitor your credit regularly, you only pull it once a year, but remember you pulled it in January. Now let's say it's June and you decide you want to go purchase a home. So you go, you have the lender pull your credit and you come to find out that you have several collection accounts that you did not do. What do you do in that case? Now see, if you would have been, uh, if you would have known that you could invest in what's called a credit monitoring service, which is where you typically pay anywhere from $10 a month to as much as $30 a month for a monthly three in one credit report. Now you may say, well, I have to pay for my credit report. That's expensive compared to what? I know people who spend as much as $500 a month on cable television. I don't even want to know what channels you're watching for $500 a month. But more importantly, I, under, I want you to understand that your credit monitoring is more like an investment. See, that monthly investment is going to protect your credit score, which is the investment of all investments, because as we just talked about, your credit score is pretty much your digital fingerprint. So understand, Yes, I highly recommend having access to a three in one credit monitoring service where you can get access to all three reports. Now, there's another company out there that's also free where to give you access to Equifax and TransUnion only. Now, that's better than nothing. And it actually can update every seven days. But here's the downfall about that. I just talked about earlier that you can have a 500 on one, a 600 on one, and a 700 on another credit bureau. Now, let's say on Equifax, excuse me, you have a 600, on TransUnion you have a 700, and then you go to the dealership, you want to apply for an auto loan, and they pull Experian. But on Experian you have the 500. So now you're going to the dealership not knowing why you got denied because you're going off of a Credit Karma score. Now, here's the thing I want to inform you about. Yes, it's free, but you get what you pay for, and that's in every area of your life. So it's definitely worth the investment to just go ahead and pay for the credit monitoring service, and it'll give you that peace of mind that you'll need, so that way you can walk into that bank, walk into that dealership, walk and apply for whatever it is that you're trying to apply for more confidently, okay? So again, just, Make the monthly investment, cut your cable bill in half, and you won't even miss the money, okay? So now, we've established what credit monitoring is. We've established that you want to have a three-in-one. Now I want to talk to you about the basics of what, how, of what makes up a credit score, okay? There are actually five components. In understanding that credit score, you're also going to still need to be able to have access to your credit monitoring. So you can actually see down below in the description, and I'm going to actually give you a link where you can go and make that investment to get access to your three in one credit report. So you don't even have to go and search. I'm going to give you the information. Okay. So now the five components of what makes up a perfect credit profile. That's the other thing that I want to educate you on. It's bigger than just a score, depending on what your end goal is. I want to teach you how to understand what makes up a credit profile. Now the reason that's important is because you can have someone who's 17 years old getting ready to turn 18 and on their 18th birthday they go out and get a $500 credit card, okay? Now, as long as they make their payments on time, as long as they keep a low balance, they'll have a 750 credit score within 30 to 45 days. Now, that doesn't mean they can go out and buy a luxury vehicle. That doesn't mean they can go out and get hundreds of thousands of dollars from the bank as a small business, uh, uh, small business funding. It doesn't even mean they can go and buy a house for a quarter of a million dollars. That just means that they have a strong credit score. What, the, what I'm going to teach you is how to build a strong credit profile so no matter what it is you're trying to apply for, you can get approved with confidence. 
because that's really the name of the game. See, credit is like the new hot topic right now because here's the thing, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're just trying to improve your quality of life, it all starts with credit. Did you know that your credit score dictates the school zone that your children go to school in? That's right, your credit score. Typically, when you have bad credit, it is a, it's an expensive lifestyle having bad credit. You're paying more interest rates. You're putting two to three times down on deposits. You're putting 20 to 30% down on an automobile. See, when you have great credit, you don't even put money down on a vehicle. So now you can walk into that dealership with confidence. That's what this information is going to be able to do for you. Now, I may, it may be some of you on here who are in the car dealership industry, and now I just hurt your business because people aren't coming in with down payments. But here's the thing, when they come in with good credit, now they can get an even more expensive vehicle if they choose so, with a lower payment. So it may actually help your business by showing your clients this information. So now, the five components of what makes up a credit score. The first component is the most uh, important part of what makes up a credit score. 35% of our score is based up of credit history. Now, you may be asking yourself, what is credit history? Credit history is making your payments on time over time. Now, this is the largest component of what makes up a credit score. Now, having one late payment can drop a score 50 to 150 points. 50 to 150 points just by missing a credit card payment for $15. Now, you may say, well, Will, I have a late payment. Is there anything I can do about it? Yes, there is. You can actually send in what's called a goodwill letter, which essentially is a letter that's saying, hey, I've been with you guys for X amount of months. In good faith, would you be willing to overturn that late payment? Now, it's a 50-50 chance that they'll remove it. And typically, if you only have one to maybe three late payments, they're more you know, prone to ha having them uh, removed or possibly reversed versus having multiple late payments. Now, here's the other thing to keep in mind. If you have multiple late payments that are 90 or 120 days, it's actually a little more challenging than just having a 30 day late. Now, here's some more information that comes with payment history. Now, you may or may not know that all credit cards, all uh, lending institutions have what are called grace periods, which means the time period after the actual due date, which you guys can go and watch my video on the difference between due dates and statement dates, and you'll learn more information about that. But after the due date of each credit you know, trade line that you have, they have what is called a grace period, which is the time that you still have to pay before they actually submit that information as being late to the credit bureaus, okay? Now, some creditors have a 30-day grace period. Some have a 15-day grace period. Some have a 10-day grace period. And some have a one-day grace period. That's right. A lot of credit unions have what's called a one-day grace period. Now, you won't know this information unless you, act, you, know, you read the agreement, which most of us never read the contract. We're just so happy to get approved, we just sign our life away. Or more importantly, what I want you to do right now is pick up the phone after you finish watching this video, contact your creditor and ask them, is there a grace period? And if so, what is the grace period for this particular account? Because understand life happens and you want to at least be able to protect yourself in the event of life happening. You're on vacation, you're out of town, your computer stops working, whatever the case may be. You ran out of stamps for those who actually still mail in their payments but at least you have that peace of mind to know, okay, I'm one day late, it won't affect me because I still have 29 more days. Now, because here's the thing, the more information you have, the more armed you are to be able to protect yourself, to be more offensive in case you have to be defensive in lieu of you potentially getting a late payment. Now understand, 35% of your score being tied to payment history, it is extremely important to make sure that you make all your payments on time. Now, here's the actual rule of thumb or strategy I typically give all of my clients. Now, I typically tell my clients to put all their bills on auto pay, at least for the minimum payment, because in the event, if life does happen, at least the minimum payment is always serviced, and then anything else you wanna pay above and beyond, you can do so manually. Now, another thing, and this is really just 
a tip and trick and kind of giving you some strategy and helping you increase that credit score, paying the balance off in full doesn't really help your credit score much. Now, it'll save you in paying in interest over time, but I want people to know that just because you pay the balance in full, it does not help your score. Now, going into the second component of what makes up your credit score, depending on how much of that balance you pay, actually will have an impact on your credit score, and that is credit usage. 30% of your score is based off of credit usage. Now, what is credit usage? Credit usage is tied to your revolving credit accounts, i.e. credit cards or department store cards. Matter of fact, when it comes to department store cards, stay away from them. You know, the little 10 or 15 percent that they're going to tell you that you're going to save, you pay that up. You pay that in taxes. The limits are small. I mean, the typical credit limit for a department store card is anywhere between 250 to 750 dollars. So now if you have a bunch of 250 or $750 uh, department store cards, it can actually hurt your high limit, um, you know, overall high limit. So when you go and apply for more higher tier credit cards, they're going to look at the combined average of what your average high limit is. And if you have a bunch of 250, 500s, 750s, $1,000 credit card limits, when you walk into American Express or when you walk into Chase or when you walk into Bank of America, guess what the average limit is is going to be on your credit card? Five, six, seven hundred dollars. So my rule of thumb, you know, just stay away from department store cards. You'd be better off just using your regular credit card. You may have a, card, a credit card to have airline points. So if you're going to use it in your department store, at least get some airline points. But more importantly, credit usage is the second largest component of what makes up your credit score. Now, there's two different types of credit, that, and, I, and this is going to be very helpful for you in understanding this information. Now, the two types of credit you have what is called revolving, which is what I just talked about, and you have installment. Now, revolving would be anything with the revolving balance, credit card, department store card, et cetera, et cetera. An installment would be anything with a fixed payment. A fixed payment would be like a mortgage, an auto loan, a student loan, anything where you have a fixed payment. Now, your credit usage is only tied to revolving accounts. It's not tied to installments. And the reason it's important to know that is because I've actually sat down with clients who said, oh, I got to pay everything off to get my credit usage down. No, you don't. Because what you're possibly thinking about is DTI, which is debt to income ratio, which is where a lender will actually compare your total debt versus your actual income. And that gives them a, a, an algorithm to, to go off of to determine how much they can actually approve you for credit to see if you can actually service the debt. But when it comes to credit usage, it is solely tied only to revolving credit. Now, how does that work? So let's say you have a credit card for $1,000. Okay. Now, let's say that's over the course, let's say that's a cumulative between two credit cards. So you have two $500 credit cards totaling $1,000 because you're going to take the combined total of all of your credit limits to calculate your credit usage. Now, anytime you go over 30% of your total credit limit, that is going to impact your credit score where your score is going to be calculated and it can drop your score significantly the further over that 30% that you go. And it's no coincidence that it also makes up 30% of your score. Now, here's another thing. If you don't have any credit cards or any revolving credit, you actually are missing what makes up essentially 30% of your credit score. Why is that important? Because some, some of us have been taught that credit is bad. It's not that credit is bad, it's the fact that people who are irresponsible with credit is bad. No different than people who are irresponsible with their checking account is bad. Look, I know people who have burned every single bank in their city, they have to move to the next town. So it's not just about being irresponsible with credit. That's people who are irresponsible with money, period. So now here's the other thing. Not having access to enough credit can be detrimental to your score because, again, it's tied to your credit usage. Now, we just talked about life can happen. So let's say you had only $1,000 of combined total revolving credit. And, you know, life happened. You had to use $700 of that credit. Okay. 
what just happened? You use 70% of your total credit usage. What just happened to your score? Drop significantly. Because again, remember, anytime you go over 30% of your total credit limit is gonna impact your score. Now the good thing is, is that this is something that can be fixed immediately. You just gotta get your balance down. So if you have $1,000 in total available credit, $300 is pretty much what you wanna calculate as your total limits before it reports. Because anything over that $300, which is 30%, can drop your score. Only that's tied to revolving credit, not installment. Now, in the event if that happened, what can you do? A couple different things. Now, depending on the relationship you have with the bank, uh, how well you've made your payments, you don't have any late payments, no slow payments, et cetera, et cetera, you can actually call the bank and ask for what's called a CLI, which stands for a credit limit increase. So now, remember, you had a total of $1,000 of available credit. Two credit cards, both of them are $500 a piece. So you may contact that bank and say, hey, I've been with you guys for X amount of years, made all my payments on time, my income has increased, my DTI, which stands for debt to income ratio, has decreased. I would like to apply for a credit limit increase. So they may take those two $500 cards and now approve you for $2,500 each so now you have a total of $5,000 of available credit. So now, I often say at rule of thumb, or just in case of emergency, you wanna have at least access to $5,000 to $10,000 of available credit just in case of emergency. Because going back to the scenario where you only had 1,000 and you had an emergency that cost you $700, your score just dropped because you used 70% of your credit. But let's say you had $10,000 of available credit, same family emergency, you had to use $700. Now your score only, your usage is only at 7%. It didn't impact your score much. So this is why knowing this information is vital. And 40% of people who have credit challenges don't have bad credit. They just, their credit usage is too high. So all you have to do is be able to get your credit usage down and you'll see your score increase literally overnight. Now some may say, well, how long will it take for my score to increase? Literally all you have to do is contact your bank and find out with the, uh, what day of the month they submit and post that information to the credit bureaus. So it may be within 30 days, it may be within the next five days, but as soon as they report that information, you'll be able to see your score increase, but the only way you will know is if you have credit monitoring. If you're waiting till next January to pull your credit again, you won't know. So this is another reason why you wanna have access to credit monitoring so you'll be able to see the positive impacts and the positive changes that you're gonna be able to see within your credit profile literally immediately within that 30 day window. So now, we talked about payment history, which is 35% of our score. We talked about credit usage, which is 30% of what makes up our credit score. The next thing is 15%, which is pretty much age of credit file. Age of credit file. Now, this 15% plays a significant role in calculating your score as well, because here's the thing. Some people have what is called a thin credit file. What is a thin file? That means they don't have a ton of credit. Now, let's say you have a thin file and all you have is an auto loan, okay? Now, you, you, you have an auto loan, you had 48 months to pay this loan off, you're at month 47, you're high-fiving your family, you're posting on social media, I'm about to be debt-free, y'all, and you make that 48th payment and your score just dropped 150 points. Why is that? Because you are missing out on what makes up 80% of your credit score. And you may be asking yourself, Will, where in the hell did you get 80 from? Well, you're missing out on payment history, which is 35% of your score, because when you paid that auto loan off, there's no more payments that are gonna be made. So that's 35% of your score. You don't have any credit cards, which is 30% of your score. And then 15% is based off of age of file, which calculates to 80%. So, Age of file is very important because when you no longer have any information reporting, 
there's nothing to tie it to. Another example, you may have a credit card that you had a high balance on for seven to 10 years and you're sitting your family down at the table and you're like, look family, we're finally gonna be debt free. We're paying off all of our credit cards in the next 30 days and I don't want anybody else to ask me for anything. We're not going to Disney. <laughs> And so you pay off that credit card and you call the bank and say, hey, ABC credit card company, close my card, shut it down. I paid y'all, you guys, your last payment. I'm debt free. I'm excited. And now I'm going to go live under a cave because I don't believe in credit no more. Hopefully that's not you that says that. But nevertheless, you've closed all your credit cards. Guess what just happened to your score? They dropped because it's tied to your age of file, your payment history you no longer have any credit usage. So again, if you, if and when you pay those credit card, those credit cards off, don't close them. Just put them away in a shoebox, put them in a safe. Remember they're for in case of emergency situations. Okay. Because here's the thing, and this is how I want you to look at credit because this is why people are really scared of credit. You know, people are scared of credit because we haven't learned how to use credit effectively and properly, you know? So we, we, at a, early age, sometimes we may have gotten ourselves in a lot of debt. We finally climb out and not understanding that credit is actually a lifeline. Here's what I mean. Let's say you have to go and replace your water heater or your furnace in your home. And that total may be anywhere from 1500 to $3,000. Now, if you don't have the actual cash in the bank, what are you going to use? You're probably going to use a credit card. Now, if you only have a, a, a thousand dollar credit card limit, and you need $3,000 to replace the furnace and you don't have the cash in the bank. Now you're stuck to, to possibly having to go borrow the money from a friend or family. You have to go to a payday loan store where now you're spending as much as 500% in interest for a, a, an additional $2,000. Payday loans are brutally expensive. Now, this is why I educate people on why the power of credit is so important. Just for in a case of emergency situations, credit could be used. So now you can put that furnace on your credit card, even if you have to spread it out over two or three cards, and now you're only making a minimum payment to, to pay back that against that furnace that you had to use to put back into your home. See, credit really can be a lifeline when you understand how to use the tools and stop looking at it just from a consumer standpoint of saying credit cards are bad. Credit cards are not bad. It is people who are uneducated on how to properly use credit cards, which is what makes them bad because we've been conditioned to think and been taught that credit cards are bad. Wealthy people understand how to use credit properly. Wealthy people understand the power of leveraging credit, how to invest in, in, in how to purchase investment properties using credit. And so that's why I'm teaching you this information. It's bigger than just being able to go to the mall or go to the club or do whatever it is that we've been uh, desensitized to think what credit is for. OK, so now the age of file also can be impacted when you're frivolously just applying for credit. So if you have an age of file that's fairly thin, meaning less than two to three years old, every time you go apply for credit and let's say you go and apply for 10 new accounts, and you get those approvals, that age of file starts to decrease. Now, I'm not saying applying for new credit is bad. It's just you want to make sure you have a strategy on how and why you are applying for new credit. OK, now a strong, healthy age of file is typically anywhere from two to five years old, two to five years old. Once you get past that two year mark threshold, the next um, the next benchmark is to get to about that five year mark. Now, another reason why this is important, I get a lot of people who come to me and say, Will, I have a 700 score. I'm trying to get to an 800. How do I do that? A lot of times that's tied to your age of file. Remember, the stronger the age of your file is, especially if you have everything else in place, is going to help you to get your score up. Remember, this is 15% of your credit score. So you want to make sure that you know this information because, see, you can get the same approvals with a 700 from an 800. 800 is really bragging rights. I'm, I'm here to tell you that. I mean, when you walk into a dealership with an 800, you'd be surprised. A lot of dealerships don't see clients that come in with 800 credit scores. So now you're Mr. Wound Tree. Now they, they, they roll out the red carpet. They're bringing you champagne and 
they have a marching band when you're driving off the lot in your <laughs> new vehicle and all that stuff. Trust me, when you have great credit, you walk differently. People treat you differently. As I often say, it can level the playing field. That's why you want to understand the power of having good credit. So now, 10% mixture of credit. Now, what does mixture of credit mean? I actually taught you that a little bit earlier. You want to have some revolving and some installments. Okay? Now, some people may say, well, what if I don't have installment accounts, I only have revolving? Should I go out there and create some installment accounts? Now, I'm not saying go out there and buy a car because we may have heard the ads, hey, come on down and purchase this vehicle and build your credit. Now, short term, that does not help you. Short term, it does not help you. The only way it helps you is payment history and then eventually mixture of credit. But that only makes up 10% of your score. So I'm not, I wouldn't go out there and spend twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on a vehicle that you may or may not be able to afford just to add an additional 10%. But what I am showing you is what makes up a perfect credit profile so that you will know how to actually position it. Now, there are programs that you can apply for to help you to build some installment accounts. But it's not necessary for you go out there to to go and create debt just to get an additional 10 points, 10 percent of what makes up your score. And the last 10 percent is new credit. The credit algorithm wants to see that over time you're applying for new credit. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, Will, isn't that counterproductive to my age of file? No, because, again, this is all done within strategy. You're not just going out there frivolously applying, especially if you're getting constantly denied. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to applying for new credit, what you're going to get are you're going to get what are called credit inquiries. Now, there are two different type of credit inquiries. You have what's called a hard credit pool and a soft. Now, what's the difference? A hard credit inquiry or credit pool is anytime you have your credit ran for the purpose to be extended credit. Anytime you have your credit ran for the purpose to be extended credit. A soft credit pool is anytime you pull your credit yourself. So you can have four different credit monitoring services look at your credit every single day and it won't impact you. But if you go and have someone pull your credit, which a piece of information of it or advice, I know you know, individuals who have friends or family members who are realtors. So they go to their realtor friend and say, hey, can you run my credit for me so I can look at my credit? Because I don't want to pay some, I don't want to go on one of those websites and pay 30, 40 bucks a month to be able to pull my credit. Well, guess what? Because a lender or a realtor is having your credit ran, the, the credit algorithms is assuming that you're having your credit pulled for the purpose to be extended a mortgage. So when they run your credit, it will actually cause a hard credit inquiry. So be very careful and just make the monthly investment, okay? So now, in the event of having those credit inquiries, you can actually have those inquiries removed. Matter of fact, if you see the link down in my, uh, my description, I'll actually have an ebook that you can invest in to clean up your inquiries because those pesky inquiries can actually prevent you from being approved for more credit. Now, you may say, well, Will, how does inquiries affect my credit score? See, here's the thing. The more inquiries you have, especially with the denials, it can actually drop your score more. Not only that, when you're going to ap apply for unsecured credit, and what does that mean? So you have two different types of credit. You have secured and you have unsecured. Now, secured credit would be like a secure credit card where you put your money up to go and get some credit. Unsecured is when you can apply just based off of your credit profile, your income, and a couple other data points that they're looking at. Now, you can have a 750 credit score, but if you have too many credit inquiries and you go to the bank and apply for a credit card, did you know they will actually deny you? So again, understanding by knowing this information or even knowing that you can clean up your credit inquiries is powerful. Here's another thing that you may or may not know. Every time you go to the car dealership, they can actually run your credit seven to 15 times per car dealership. So let's say you go to three dealerships in one day, that's as much as 45 credit inquiries accumulatively. Now your score just dropped 40 points and you don't know why. 
That's why knowing this information is vital. So here's another tip for you. Now, if you, when you are out there car shopping, hopefully you're not doing it just to build your credit, but you legitimately want to go purchase a new vehicle. You need to purchase a new vehicle. You want to upgrade. You're helping your spouse get a vehicle, your child, or whatever the case may be. My recommendation is actually go to your bank, have them pull your credit. You let them know how much you're trying to get pre-approved for, and they're going to do one credit pull. Now they're going to cut you a check. You go to the dealership and now you can purchase the vehicle and it potentially may even be able to give you some negotiating power because now you're going to the dealership with a check in hand, which is almost like cash. So now you're not paying all their pesky finance fees and, and, and you're not tied to whatever their interest rate uh, incentive is. You know, a lot of car dealerships actually in, in, increase your uh, uh, APR on an automobile because they get additional points by increasing your interest rate. So they may have approved you for 3%, but they tack on another two because they're going to make money. But when you know this information and now you can walk into your bank, get one credit pool and now go to the dealership that you want to apply for. So understanding how those credit inquiries can impact you. Again, see the link in the description below and I'll have my ebook where you can actually get your inquiries cleaned up within 24 hours. Now, a couple other things. You may be saying, well, Will, what if I have collection accounts? Understanding the five components of what builds my credit profile doesn't help me there. Well, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to deal with collection accounts. Now, I actually have a video on YouTube why you should not pay your collection account. I highly recommend you go and watch that video. Now, I'm also going to give you some tips and strategies in understanding how to deal with collection accounts here. So now, first of all, what is a collection account? Anytime you have a debt that has been written off or that's more than 120 to 150 days past due, they're going to sell that debt off. Now, there's a, a charge off account and then there's a collection account. A collection account is when they've sold the debt to a debt buyer. A charge off account is typically where they've charged the account off and deemed it as being uncollectible. And nine times out of 10, they probably wrote the debt off on their taxes. Okay. Now here's the thing. If you have a collection or a charge off, it actually can impact you the exact same way. Now you can have a collection account for $1 to a hundred thousand dollars and it's going to have the same impact because it's the data that's being reported. Now, if you have a collection account, it's not the end of the world. You can actually do several things. Now, some people are saying, you know what? The account went to collection. Let me call them and pay this $1. This is actually a true story. Now, I may be dating myself here, but how many people remember about 15 years ago, they had a company, I think it was Columbia House Records or whatever the case may be, I don't know the exact name, inside the magazine where you can purchase 10 CDs for a dollar. Now, they would actually send you the 10 CDs before you even sent them the dollar. But here's the thing, some people forgot to send the dollar in. Now, because they have your name and address, they can actually send you to collections for one dollar. Because here's the thing, the credit bureaus authenticate us based upon our name and address, which is why a lot of times people have addresses that are not theirs that end up on their credit report, especially if you have a common name. Can you imagine if your name was John Smith, how many people's <laughs> information may end up on your credit report, especially if you live on an address that's common as well. So understand, you can have a collection account for that $1. You say, oh, you know what? Let me contact this collection agency and pay them that $1. Here's the thing, and this is why I said in that video why you shouldn't pay your collection accounts. And the disclaimer is, is why you shouldn't pay it without knowing the proper information and the proper strategy. See, you pay the collection account off, now it shows as a $0 collection account, and what happens is, is now the information updates, reports as a new collection account, because remember, it's not based upon how much you owe, it's based off of the data so even though it's zero dollars, it updates and shows as an updated collection and it can actually drop your score. See, with collection accounts, you have what are called zombie debt accounts, which means the older the debt has sat on your credit report, it becomes less impactful. So now this dollar collection account that was five years old, you decided to pay it off. Now it's showing as a zero dollar account. It updated as a new collection and dropped your credit score. 
So this is why you don't want to pay the collections without knowing what to do. The most effective strategy is to be able to dispute it. You want to dispute the debt. Now, here's the thing when you're disputing the debt. Now, I don't recommend that you dispute utilizing the credit monitoring uh, 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 software because they're using the exact same software that the credit bureaus use. The eOscar software is the exact same one the credit monitoring use, so it's almost like trying to kill them with their own poison. They become immune to it. So what I highly recommend is that you actually dispute the, uh, the derogatory item, the collection account, the charge off account, even if it's a late payment or whatever it is you want to dispute, the repossession, you can dispute anything reporting negatively on your credit report and you want to mail it in, certified mail, and actually have them to verify that the information is being reported accurately. Now, if the information isn't being reported accurately, they have to remove it. Here's an example. Let's say you owe $500, okay, and it goes to a collection agency. Now, what typically happens is the collection agencies go out there and they purchase the debt. They actually purchase portfolios of debt. And how that happens is, is let's say they find a company that has a, a portfolio of debt that accumulates up to about $350,000. They'll actually contact that company and, and let's say they invest $60,000 to purchase that debt. Now these aren't accurate numbers, so don't beat me up in the comments and say, Will, they can't purchase it for that. This is just an example, guys. So you purchase the debt for $60,000 accumulatively, okay? And one of the accounts in that debt portfolio is your account for $500 that you owe ABC collection agency. Now, the, the collection agencies are in business just like any other business. So they're going to try to make as much money as possible. So they may tack on fees and the fees are minimal a lot of the time. So they may say, you know what, we're going to charge you $510.23. Now remember, you only owe $500. So when you're disputing this information, they have to prove all the way down to the penny that that debt is being reported accurately. And if not, they have to delete it off your credit report. Now, the reason you want to mail it in certify one, so that way you have a paper trail to actually track when they receive that dispute letter. And then if they don't respond within 30 days by law, they're supposed to remove it. But if they don't, then you want to send a second follow-up letter asking them to actually validate the debt. And then if they can't and they still don't and they still decide not to remove it, you can actually sue the credit bureaus for not following within the guidelines of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Now, the thing about suing the credit bureaus is that they get sued every single day. I've actually had clients who may have owed $500, but has actually sued the collection agents, uh, excuse me, sued the credit bureau and actually got as much as $1,000 awarded to them in that suit. A lot of times they like to settle. And so understand this is just a strategy. It doesn't mean just because you dispute it is going to automatically come off. Remember the debt is still technically legitimately yours, possibly, unless it's identity theft. This is just a strategy that I recommend when disputing the debt. Now, here's another thing that I want you to understand. When you're disputing the debt, you still technically owe it, especially if it's within the window of time that they can report the debt on your credit report. Now, in the event of that, they still have the opportunity to sue you. There's something called the statute of limitations, which is the time frame that they actually have to sue you on that debt. Now, depending on the type of debt it is, if it's an open account, if it's an oral agreement, a written agreement, you can actually Google all of this information. That determines the time frame, and also depending on the state you live in, that determines the time frame that they have to sue you. Now, in most cases, the statute is up to four years from the last date of activity. The last date of activity is any time that's the last date that a dollar has actually been trans you know, ha has been transmitted on that actual account. So here's another thing from a settlement standpoint that can actually hurt you. Let's say you decide to settle an account and you have an account for $5,000, okay? You do a settlement offer, which means you're gonna pay half the balance, but then you're gonna make payments on that account. So let's say that account was six years old and it was, uh, you hadn't made any payments in six years, you decide to do a settlement offer, you're making payments on it, and then you start making payments and then you say, you know what, I'm not paying them anymore. It's old anyway, it's about to fall off. 
Well, guess what just happened? The statute can actually restart and re-age, and now they can still come after you, and it starts that clock over again, which is, again, in my previous video, why I say why you shouldn't pay your collection accounts. But again, the disclaimer is without knowing the proper information. And so understanding, even though you dispute it, and if it's past the statute, but it's, uh, excuse me, but it's within the statute, if it comes off, they still can come and sue you or potentially sue you. Okay, so just be conscious and understand that that potentially could happen. And if that does happen, you may want to seek legal counsel, uh, speak with a, a company that negotiates debt or you can try to negotiate it. Or that's when you possibly even want to do a settlement offer. So this way you're not paying court fees and all these other fees. But nevertheless, in order to get it off your account, the most effective way is always to dispute first. Because the only way, as I mentioned, your score is going to go back up because we, as we mentioned, a collection account can drop your score as much as 150 points. The only way your score will go back up is to actually get it removed and disputing it is the most effective way and the, the least costly because now you're not paying the full 5,000. Remember, that may not even be your account or the account is being reported inaccurately and they have to remove it. Okay. Now, we talked about collections and charge offs. Inquiries now you may be saying well Will, what about public records and for those who don't know what a public record is a public record would be considered like a bankruptcy Okay, now a bankruptcy can drop a credit score as much as 200 points Now here's the thing there's actually two different types of bankruptcy that can report on your credit report You have what's called a dismissed bankruptcy and a discharge the reason it's important to know because sometimes most people may not know the difference, but when it comes to a dismissed bankruptcy, that is actually when you filed the paperwork, but you didn't actually go through the bankruptcy proceeding. And it still will report on your credit report and drop your score as much as 200 points. Now, some people may use it as a strategy to stop a creditor from garnishing their wages. Some people decided to go through the process and decided at the last minute based upon some advice that they received. Now, I'm not an attorney. OK, so this is not legal advice, but the only time I typically have people possibly consider looking at bankruptcy as an option if their wages are attempting to being garnished. OK, so sometimes people get some new information to decide, oh, I don't have to file bankruptcy just because I have a late payment or my wages aren't being garnished, but they've already filed the paperwork and it's been submitted, but you didn't go through the actual process. That's when it's reporting as dismissed. Discharge is when you actually go through and they've either wiped out all of your creditors or you are on a wage earner pay uh, a wage earner program where you're paying your debts back. Now, the bankruptcy can report on the report for up to 10 years because in some states it could vary <clears throat> as much as I believe 12 to 15 years, but 10 years. But understand, you can dispute a public record off of your credit report just because you filed or you just use the strategy of filing to stop creditors from garnishing your wages, doesn't mean you have to let it sit on your credit report for 10 years. See, on that credit report, the information has to still be reporting accurate, has to be reported accurately, meaning the day the actual paperwork was filed with the clerk's office has to be accurate. Matter of fact, if you have filed bankruptcy, go and look at your credit report and you'll be surprised that the file date a lot of the times is different on each credit reporting uh, agency. And so that's a discrepancy. So you can actually dispute that information based off of that discrepancy. Now, you may have to dispute more than once. I actually had a client who sent in 12 disputes before they got it removed. And so they said, well, I'd rather dispute it and that's 12 months versus waiting 10 years to have it removed. So sometimes you just have to put in a little bit of sweat equity. So understand, we talked about how to build a perfect credit profile. We talked about the importance of credit monitoring services. We talked about the difference in a paid one versus a free one. We talked about credit inquiries. We talked about, uh, uh, you know, a thin credit file, we talked about a dense credit profile, we talked about collections, we talked about charge off, we talked about public records. So now that you have all of this information, you can be uh, more sound in your decision making and one, understanding what makes up a credit profile, two, in the event that you have a credit challenge, how to repair it, because here's the beautiful thing about credit, it can always be rebuilt. 
It can always be restored. And no matter where you are on your credit journey, don't get discouraged. Now, it may take some time. It may take you two years to repair your credit. Look, when I started my credit journey, I started out at a 410 credit score, and it took me two years to fix my credit. But here's the beautiful thing about credit. When you understand the power of credit and how to leverage it and all of that good stuff, once your credit is, in, is repaired, you're in position for a lifetime. And the reason I say a lifetime is because even if you have some credit challenges, you have enough information to get yourself out of that challenge, to overcome that obstacle, to overcome that hurdle, to now reposition yourself so you can go out there and apply for that dream home, apply for that dream job. Uh, get some business capital to start that new business, grow your business, scale your business. So this is the power and the importance of understanding credit. This information will give you enough to be able to help maintain your credit. This will give you enough information for you to even be able to recalibrate if you have to in the event of getting a collection of charge off, potentially save you from filing bankruptcy if you don't need to, and also knowing the difference between dismiss and discharge. So what I would like you to do is just take some time for those who may not have done so, go and pull your credit report, see where you stand and see how this information can help you. For those who need those few extra points to get over that hurdle, maybe you just need to get your credit utilization lower to improve your credit score. Maybe you have those pesky credit inquiries. See the link in the description to see how to clean up those inquiries within 24 hours with my formula and my secret sauce where I'm gonna give you word for word what to say to the credit bureaus, the phone number, the call, and even the prompts to get through their uh, extremely difficult <laughs> automated system. And so hopefully this information was helpful for you. What I want you to do is I want you to actually subscribe to this channel. I want you to comment down below. Let me know what you've learned here. Share, like, comment, do all of those cool things because the powerful thing about understanding credit is that it is your digital fingerprint. It's like your second fingerprint and credit is used for everything in our everyday lives. So I appreciate you going on this journey on how to increase your credit score. My name is Will Roundtree and I'll see you at the top.